Welcome to the Society Pod, a podcast for entrepreneurs, marketers, and leaders. Here's your host, Jessica Yarmy. All right. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Society Pod. My guest today is a working mom. We're right around Mother's Day, so we'll talk about that a bit. And she spent her entire career in franchising, working for mega brands that you all probably know, like Yum Brands, Nothing Bunt Cakes. And she is currently the U.S. Franchise Development Manager for Studio Pilates. And you guys know I love this Pilates game. So welcome to the show, January Swiderski. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to I'm excited to have you here because I feel like we need to catch up on this Pilates game that you are playing right now. The Pilates space is buzzing right now. It's it's huge. I mean, SNL even did a spoof on it, right? So it it definitely is a hot topic, but I'm excited to be with a brand that I I know is not gonna, you know, fizzle out. It's just gonna get better and better. So I'm excited to be in the fitness realm. It's a new space for me. But, um, you know, really excited about it. So tell me about Studio Pilates. All I know really is that they are an Australian Pilates concept that you are really trailblazing for them to bring their brand into the U.S. But give us all the background on Studio Pilates. Absolutely. Um, So... Yes, they are an Australian base based in Brisbane. They actually, we've actually been here in the U.S. with our two pioneer franchisees um, since 2020. Um, but the brand itself has been around for 20 plus years. I love it because the story is so organic. Our founders, Kenya and Jade Winter, you know, they started this brand really from grassroots, you know took out a cash advance on a business credit card, you know, and have really worked very hard to get it right. And in my humble opinion, I really think they have, you know, Tanya, she actually um, is a physical or physiotherapist by trade. And so everything that we do is really based in physical therapy. You know, the sequencing of our exercises, our programming, Um, And then Jade, he actually is a former Olympic athlete. So he swam for Australia um, back in the day. So just really their combined love of sport and um, physical therapy and health and wellness is how we came to be. And, um, you know, we just opened our 100th studio uh, globally in Chanhassen, Minnesota, which was amazing. We now have seven open and operating uh, studios in the U.S., but we have another 12 units signed and more in the pipeline. You know, just the way that we do things, it's, it's very different than any other concept. So, you know, we incorporate technology, which is different, um, but it allows our instructors to really focus on our clients. So our clients get their instruction um, from the technology, which is, you know, our intellectual property. And then they, our instructors are able to actually focus on the clients, ensuring that they're doing every exercise, every movement correctly. And it just makes it more efficient and more effective. Well, congratulations on the studio count to hit a hundred. And then also for the pipeline in the U S that's a big deal. It's exciting. It's exciting. I mean, it's, I would say it's been a challenge, but it actually hasn't. Um, You know, I think right now, slow and steady wins the race. Mm -hmm. We're focused on quality over quantity because Mm -hmm. we know the quantity is going to come. I will say, you know, our studios are spawning other studios quickly, you know, um, even from just a few openings that we've had since I've been on board, I already have potential franchisees in the pipeline because they experience a class and they're like, I want to own one. So I love that. How many reformers are in an average studio? So minimum, we have 12 reformers. So that's the requirement. Um, But we have studios that are opening with 14, 15, 16. Um, We have studios globally that, you know, because the demand is so high, they actually are like, knocking down walls and ordering more reformers. Mm -hmm. And we have 
I think, 19, 20 reformer studios. That's amazing. Yeah. As you know, I have a little bit of background in the Pilates you space. You do. And I get asked to consult with people a lot about the Pilates space. And one of the calls I was on recently, the investor says to me, like, do you think there's more market size available for Pilates or is it basically sold out? You know, is, is there more people that we can, that we could pull into the modality? And I love that question because I feel like when I started in the Pilates space in 2017, uh, we really tried to broaden the base of who the typical Pilates consumer was, but then there's still mm -hmm. so much work to do in that arena. And you know, the top male athletes in every single sport do Pilates. And yep. so as soon as it becomes more, or let's say less stigmatized to do Pilates as a man, to reap the benefits in your golf game, to reap the benefits in whatever other sport you're playing as a complimentary. Um, yes. Yeah. Me, whatever it is. And that, and that honestly is something that I love about our brand. We, um, we're inclusive. So mm -hmm. something that's very different about us is that our classes, they're not level um, because the way that our programming is put together, every exercise that we use can be progressed or regressed for intensity by just adding or subtracting springs. So, you know, we're not targeting the young and the beautiful already fit necessarily. Mm -hmm. We are targeting everybody. And, you know, when I'm talking to potential franchisees, I tell them there is an untapped untapped demographic here in the US, specifically men, and then also the older generation, as far as, you know, um, mobility, you know, just as we balance, get, like, stability, yeah, all like, of it. Yeah, the, all like, of it. Pains and the everything, you know, with the low impact, strengthening mm -hmm. your core, your core is what holds everything together. So um, we really have designed, well, they have designed and our brand really is, is for everyone. And I, I, I say, you know, if you have a pulse, you can benefit from coming to our studio. So, yeah. and, and it, you know, it's very intentional through our branding. Um, you're not going to walk into a studio and see like bright pink walls or anything like that. It's very upscale, high end, but, um, you know, black and white. And then mm -hmm. every, every exercise is going to be, it's very, you know, simplistic but effective and efficient. It's very consistent. Um, you know, I've been to classes where we have 20 year olds and then we also have 75 year olds in the same mm -hmm. class and they all walk out and they're satisfied. Mm -hmm. As you know, I love a good clean brand and I think your brand is amazing. It has such a good solid foundation to, to build from. It's not cutesy or overthought or overcooked. It's just really like clean and classic and relatable like to all of those different demographics that you're talking about. Um, yes. And I want to just give a little teaser because if you're somebody who likes Pilates or if you're somebody who wants some Studio Pilates merch, stay tuned to the end or skip forward to the end, let's be honest. And we'll, we'll reveal a little giveaway that we're going to do with some Studio Pilates stuff. So Okay, Maybe. let's let's zoom out and like talk more franchising as a whole. Like how did you initially get into franchising? Accident, honestly. So, um we'll rewind. I have actually been in franchising for 6 years. Prior to this, I worked in the government sector um for the IRS, which was fun, but um I just wanted growth. You know, I learned a lot, but I wanted growth and Jumping from, um, you know, the public to the private sector, it's a risk, right? And I was a paralegal, legal assistant. So I just started applying for executive assistant positions. Um, I ended up landing a position at Pizza Hut for, and I was the executive assistant for the COO at the time, Nicola Berkier, who was phenomenal. and. Honestly, when I got the role, I didn't even know what really a franchise was. Um, I didn't know Pizza Hut was a franchise. I didn't know Yum. I didn't know that essentially everything you look at is 
it's pretty much a franchise at this point, you know? So I really started from the bottom and I got a lot of exposure, which I'm very thankful for. I have amazing mentors. Um, I got to work with the likes of Wanda Williams, who is phenomenal, and Erica Garza. I was, you know, on their team and they just really poured into me and I learned so much. Um, from there, then I transitioned to the legal team at Pizza Hut, which really, I think, gave me a, no a lot of knowledge just about this huge machine of franchising. You know, you have to know the contracts. What are the stipulations? What, what is an FDD? What is, what is all of this stuff? So, you know, taking that knowledge um, from there, I was able to then progress my career. When you say you started from the bottom, you're on a global brand of Pizza Hut. So I think you need to give yourself a little more credit than, um, than starting from the bottom. Now I'm here. But let's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let that comment. We'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. Um, from a knowledge base of for sure. I had for sure. absolutely no clue. But then you dove into the deep end. So you're in Yum Brands and then you go to Nothing Bunt Cakes, another huge franchise. Huge. And and so now where you have years of experience like with these different brands, as you probably have a lens where you could zoom out and say or look at a small brand that's coming up. Like what do you what do you see small brands doing poorly that your big brand experience kind of allows you to see. Absolutely. So what I'm seeing is, you know, small brands, hey, we're all hungry. We all want to grow. But you have to grow intentionally. And you have to grow with the right people. You have to build that infrastructure of support. Otherwise, it's all going to fall, you know. And, and I think the most important thing is to be able to walk the talk. You can promise certain things, but if you don't have that support structure in place and you can't carry through, then you're not going to accomplish much. Um, and I think really growing too fast is, it's a dangerous thing, you know, um, because if you grow with the wrong people, one thing that everyone knows in franchising, your first 10 franchisees, they have to be successful because yeah. from a lending standpoint, if someone fails, things are not going to want to work with your potential candidates down the road. Um, also, just understanding, you know, you have to have cash flow. So from a small brand perspective, having those equity units, you know, it's very important because you also have to know what does development look like? You know, are your numbers in your FDD correct? Mm -hmm. And because you don't want to be out here telling somebody, promising something, and then you can't deliver on it. So right. I think, I think small brands, it's great to be aggressive, but you have to be intentional. And I think at the end of the day, slow and steady wins the race. Yeah. Somebody asked me recently, you know, is it a thing to, to grow too fast in franchising? And I said, it's, it, it's impossible to grow too fast as long as you have the resources to be able to staff under that growth, to support under that growth. And I think that's where the, the disconnect happens, where it's, you really? know, you, you, you get that hunger, you get that, you know, ambition to chase the deals, and then you yeah. don't have that same ambition attached to your staffing and attached to your support. So you have to be able to support when you're building out 10, and especially in, you know, the QSR business, like quick service restaurants, like restaurants are beasts. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be able to, you have to have those great vendors with those great relationships. That takes time, you know, yeah. um, you also have to have, you know, the understanding of what is the timeline to build something out? What is the timeline to get your equipment shipped? You know, so just Having a realistic expectation, I think, is very important. Yeah. And, and realistic expectations, it, you end up improving over time. So early realistic expectations have to assume everything's going to go wrong. Everything's yeah. going to take longer than you think. Everything's going to be more expensive than you think. And then as you go, you dial it in, you dial it in, you dial it in. But it's not going to be perfect from day one. So I think sometimes small brands model off of big brand numbers, and they don't connect the fact that 
the big brand had 500 reps to get this figured out, to get it dialed in. And you've had five reps, you know? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And even on, you know, if you've had 10, your 11th could go terribly wrong. Um, You know, the economy is ever changing. So, and, and then also looking just, I'm learning a lot about, you know, the development process and getting those permits across the line, you know, um, just everything, anything can go wrong. You can be delayed. You can be looking for, I mean, retail real estate right now is so sparse, Yeah. Um, you know, so you just have to know what you're getting into and, and, you know, just set the tone from the get go, I think is yeah. important. Okay. So you've given us some watch outs on franchising. What do you love most about franchising? The people. The people, um, you know, I love the fact that franchising is about people because without your franchisees, there's no franchise, you know, so I love to support people. That's really, I mean, I love in my personal life, being a mom, supporting my kids, you know, and just watching people grow and watching others success. It really brings me a lot of joy and helping them get to ultimately what they're dreaming of. Um, And I think, you know, and that's what I tell people all the time, you know, I'm not in franchise sales. I don't believe that you can sell a franchise um, because ultimately at the end of the day, you have to make sure it's a right fit. It's a longstanding partnership. And this is an investment, not only of money, but also time. And it just has to be a right fit. And Mm -hmm. I love seeing people realize their dreams and and actually accomplish what they've set out to accomplish. And I just think the opportunities that this provides, it's really exciting. So I know you are also the co-chair of the Women's Franchise Network here in yes. Dallas. So yes. talk to me about that organization and what you're trying to achieve through that organization. Absolutely. So Love WFN because it connected me with you Um, and Larissa, you know, and then Caroline and Yolanda. It's just been an amazing network Um, for me, just not professionally, but personally to be able to reach out to other like-minded women, moms, not moms, business owners, and just bounce things off of you guys it has been so valuable, you know, in my personal and professional life. But the there's so much opportunity there. And I think we do have a long way to go just with, you know, our memberships and things like that. But from where we started, which was, you know, revamping this group, um, we definitely have come a long way. And now really incorporating the educational part of it. I think is important, Um, you know, inviting people who are not necessarily in franchising, but maybe want Mm -hmm. to get into it or learn more about it Mm -hmm. because there is so much opportunity. I just think that people don't know. You don't know what you don't know, you know? So I, I love the fact that we can incorporate that educational piece and the networking and the drinks and the kikiing and, you know, the meeting good people. It, it just makes it really fun and at the same time, very valuable. Franchising is such a niche in and of itself. And then layer on to be a woman in franchising. It's such a niche group of people, but you can relate on so many levels because you're a minority in a male dominated space. And, and there's, there's a lot that, um, that I think we've been able to support each other through in those conversations. And as I look at franchisees and the, and the breakdown of male to female franchise owners, and it depends on the concept, but on average or as a whole, only 25% of franchises are owned by women. And I think it's a natural evolution for a, you know, an ambitious woman to, to, step into a franchise, which allows you the control of your schedule. It still allows you to be ambitious. Why do you think that percentage is so low? And how are you through Studio Pilates kind of trying to break that barrier? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think just looking at 
business in general, right? Um, I think I read somewhere that only 10%, uh, the historically a record high, 10% in 2023 of Fortune 500 CEOs were women. And that's like a record high, 10%. Like, yeah. okay, I think we've got some work to do there, right? So just looking at our society in general, um, there absolutely is that inequity, you know, with women in leadership positions anyway. So it translates into franchising and business ownership. Um, and then looking at these, you know, the brands who are the leaders of these brands, again, with only 10% being women that are leading these brands, um, that's going to translate into who you're bringing on board. You know, are you being intentional about your diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, gender being one of those, you know, modifiers. So like, if, if we're not being intentional about it, and then also, you know, I think women too, you know, it's that drive, it's that, it can be a scary world to navigate when you are navigating a world of men. Um, and not, not to say there's anything wrong with that, but it's really just about us to gaining our confidence and understanding that, hey, we deserve a seat at the table as well. Yeah. I look forward to seeing what your breakdown of Studio Pilates ownership ends up being because I think representation matters and to have a woman at the front of those conversations, I think will pull more women in. It, that was my experience in Kick House for sure. And the fact that you're a minority on top of being a female in business, I think it'll be interesting to see what your you know, your racial breakdown ends up being. And, and I think it, I know you often give yourself a hard time about how you show up to things. And yeah. I just think it's so important for you to show up and to be louder and to lean into it, even though it's uncomfortable, even though you don't think you're a good speaker or whatever the case may be. It's like, you're obligated to, because you are an example for so many people who are on the sidelines, just looking at this game from the outside in. And you and I are here, we're in, we're in the game, we're playing it and like share, share, share. Like here's, here's some inside scoop about what happens in the game. And it's not as intimidating as it seems from the sidelines. It's franchising is, is such an interesting business model because it's been done so many times before. There are case studies to follow. There are there's support everywhere. There's organizations that are meant to support the space. And so it is something that is a guided step into entrepreneurship. And I'm like, we got to, we got to keep on being loud, mm -hmm. even if it's, even if it's imperfect, we have to keep on pushing the, the franchising agenda. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's, you know, what I love about it is that it does provide those opportunities and, I have to say, you know, I'm really excited about the potential for this brand because it's new. We're emerging here in the U.S. and we're being intentional. You know, it's important that our franchise owners look like the areas that they are providing service to. And the diversity piece is very important to me, to my children, to see, you know, double minorities in ownership um, mm -hmm. is, is amazing, you know, and I'm actually going through um, my due diligence process pretty close almost to the finish line um, with what will be our first African-American Black woman owner. And she's going to open in Harlem, which is super I love that. And because she wants to really pour into her community because mm -hmm. everyone can benefit from this. And I just think being intentional about it is very important, um, you know, and just giving the opportunity to those that want it and those that are passionate about it. Um, already, we have a very diverse mix of franchisees coming into the fold. And I'm just super excited. And she's going to be another unlock for the next person to come in and the next person. Exactly. And I think it's just important to see people showing up in the space and showing that it, 
it, it it's a model that really works well in conjunction with a stereotypical female skill set, you know, a softer people based skill set, a communications heavy skill set, a collaboration heavy skill set. All of those are more, you know, feminine traits in a in a business person. Yes. But then also from a, a mom perspective, and I want to kind of like flip into like mom life, but the term mompreneur exists because of stay at home moms who start to want to dabble into their own ventures, whether it's Etsy stores or like online things, kind of that, that part-time side hustle. But I think, I think entrepreneur, you know, if you have the entrepreneurial itch to do something as a mom, like why not kind of dig into franchising where it, it's a it's flexible something. schedule. It, you know, it makes so much sense in terms of like having mom life be business life. Absolutely. And it's a proven business model. You know, um, you get with the, the right brand. Obviously, the FDD is going to show everything that you need to know about the success rate of the business, of the brand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You have the support. It's a playbook. It, it's a plug and play business. I think it's super smart. Um, I am at heart, not really an entrepreneur. I grew up um, as a Air Force brat, 100%. So my parents, you know, they didn't start businesses or anything like that. But, you know, I see the benefit of being a business owner. So I, in franchising, am getting a good mix, you know, of that because startups are hard as you, I, I'm speaking to the to the choir. Like, yeah. I mean, just creating something, you have to have those creative juices. You have to have that drive. You have to have the time and the sacrifice and everything. Whereas I love franchising because, and that's one thing I've helped, you know, get across the line. So many moms or as our founder, Jade, he calls them corporate refugees, which I think is amazing. I love the term because it's really people just taking a step back, mm -hmm. understanding what makes them happy. They don't want to sit at a desk all day. They don't want to be micromanaged. Um, but at the same time, they want to be successful and mm -hmm. you have a successful business model. Um, yeah. And it's extremely valuable. Or you want to get to your kid's game at 4 p.m. And it's hard to juggle all of that when you're when you're a full time kind of employee. So so let's like transition to you as you as mom because we're we're two yes. days out, three days out, recording this three days out from Mother's Day. Mother's so Day. Um, how are you celebrating Mother's Day, and how do you juggle mom life and work life? So Mother's Day, um, typically I would go up. My family lives um, in Washington, Oklahoma, and I would go up there, but. My daughter has a softball tournament tomorrow, so we are not going, but my kids definitely had, there's been a lot of, you know, um, secretive phone calls <laughs> and scurrying around and mom, turn your head and Amazon packages that are coming to the front door that I am told do not open. Cute. So it's, it's very, it's very cute. I love it. Um, and really, you know, I'm just wanting to spend time with my kids. And just kind of unplug with them, you know, whether we just go to eat or we just stay here. Um, that's really what I value. And celebrating my mom, of course, you know, and my sister who is a mom and just all the moms that I know that are amazing. Um, I think it's a special day. But really the work-life balance, I have to say, is so manageable because I do work from home, obviously, because we are headquartered in Brisbane, I think we eventually will have um, an actual space, you know, headquarters here in the US, likely in Dallas, eventually. Um, but it's nice because I am that mom that's at tennis practice on my computer sending emails, and then also cheering on my daughter, you know, um, or, you know, I'll block my calendar because I've got to go cheer my son on for a cross country race. And I do hop on on a Saturday and get some emails out or, you know, because our brand is based in Australia, hey, 
Sunday night at 6.30, our team meeting is happening. It's 9.30 a.m. on Monday, Monday. in Australia. Mm-hmm. So I am hopping on. I take calls from my work phone as I'm driving. You know, just don't turn my video on. So it's really multitasking, but I, I wouldn't have it any other way because I love to stay busy. Do your kids understand franchising? Oh, do they? Yes, <laughs> they really do. They 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 love it. Um, they actually are the biggest brand ambassadors for whichever brand I work for. They they love it. So I think it's just so fascinating because kids in school learn such strange things. You know, if you really connect the fact that like we're still teaching handwriting and yet they're eight years old and coding, you know, so they know like HTML and, and schools teaching them cursive. It's so crazy. But, um, but I love how they learn and catch on to what I didn't intentionally teach my son franchising, but he, it's like through osmosis, like he knows exactly what's going on. He understands the game. He knows certain businesses are franchised and It's just so fascinating because I, I never, I never set out to, to try to coach any of that. But then here he is a little, like little, little franchising expert. But what a gift, you know what I mean? Like what a gift to give to your son without yeah. even intentionally giving it, you know, we, yeah. we are providers, we are, you know, caretakers and mm-hmm. we teach them what we think they should know. But at the end of the day, you know, they are going to be watching it. They watch us. And Mm -hmm. I think that is so valuable just to set that example. And how amazing, you know, that our children get to see us in this space and get to learn about it because not many kids do necessarily, you know, so it's something that they can. And I, I truly think that, you know, franchising should have a larger space in the college world, in just education, you know, because not everybody wants to go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on getting a degree that they probably won't use. Um, No, no offense, but, you know, there is another route. And I think, you know, entrepreneurship and also franchising could be that route for a lot of people. I agree. I think the opportunity for kids coming out of college or even just not going to college. Yeah. Like this is going to be the generation that doesn't that doesn't go. My son's 13, your son's 13. So they have five years to decide if they have a career path that speaks to their soul or they're going to commit to, you know, continuing their education in college. And Absolutely. it I mean, I know your son's like in in a hustle game too. And he's like, he's like negotiating with you, like buy a mic to do this podcast and then give mm-hmm. it to me. Like they are smart yes. business people at 13. Yeah. Yes. My son is, I mean, he is trying to find little odds and end jobs, you know, to do so that he can make money. He went and worked for his grandmother before we went to Australia so that he could buy a GoPro so he could wear it and film everything he was doing in Australia, you know, because that's what interests him. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily sitting in a classroom and learning about Texas history, you know, yeah. and, you know, or calculus. And and I did it, but how often now in my career do I actually utilize it? You know, so I've had to really adjust my mindset because I am like college, 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 that's what you're going to do, but you can be successful without it. And I think it's okay, you know, to, to be open-minded about that, especially with opportunities like franchising. And podcast editing. I, I, I'm going to send him the, the raw clips and I'm just going to let him go ham and edit what you want. And we're going to post it and it's going to be oh, like no. the, the version two. Not a bit. <laughs> imagine what he's going to put together of his mother. I love it. Yeah. You're the like cringy mom, just, just like I am. Oh, totally. So one thing that we talk about on this podcast is kind of digging into 
what I would think of as a comeback season. And it would be a moment in your career, professional life, personal life, where you were on a low. And what are some of the things, like what was that moment, number one? And then what are some of the things, number two, that you did to get yourself out of that season? Oh gosh, how long do we have? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, you know, um, the highs, the lows, all the things I've been there um, as a single mom, you know, but I think I am in my comeback season right now, actually. And it's, it's a beautiful thing because I appreciate every single step of this journey. Um, you know, a year ago, this time, I did not have a job. So, um, you know, it was, it came out of nowhere and it was devastating because, you know, how am I going to provide? How am I going to, you know, but, um, you know, constant prayer is, is my thing. And, um, you know, I, I am a Christian and just really understanding that, you know, it's not my timing, it's God's timing. And, and I really lean into my faith. Um, but also, you know, when I didn't have a job, I worked to get a job like it was my job. So I was very diligent. Um, you know, I made it because I work from home. I've worked from home since the pandemic. I made it to where my kids had absolutely no clue, even to this day. So don't send to London this clip. Um, but even to this day, you know, they didn't know what happened. And I just worked to get work. Um, you know, and one thing was I wasn't going to settle because I felt like, I feel like everything happens for a reason. Um, it was, it was a good thing for my growth. It was a good thing for the progression of my career. Um, one thing I always am very intentional not to do is to become complacent. You know, we get comfortable and we just coast. And I love to learn. I love to grow. I always want to be in, I want to look back a year from now and say, oh my gosh, look where we're at. So I think sometimes you need a nudge, you know, and boy, did I get that nudge. Um, and, but now, you know, I've landed with this brand and it has been such a blessing. I have now gone to Australia twice. We'll go back. I've been able to bring my kids, you know, and one thing I always prayed for was the ability to make my kids world travelers because there is so much out there to see. And, um, you know, that gives you that understanding that, you know, the U S we're, we're powerful, but we're not the only country in the world. And there's so much culture to learn. And I travel, I got the opportunity to travel the world with my parents. You know, we lived in Okinawa, Japan. I was born in Panama just because of the military. And I was always like, Oh, how am I going to do this? Unless I go into the air force or something, you know, because it's expensive, but this has given me the opportunity to really not only provide be with an amazing brand that I am super passionate about and change people's lives and at the same time travel with my kids. So it, it all happened for a reason and I'm just really embracing it. I love that you started out by saying you now really appreciate that you're out of the comeback, you know, that you're out of that and you're, you're, you are where you are. And I think it's so hard to, to see it when you're, when you're in it and you know, I've been laid off three times. And as I look back, it's always the look back that shows you the answers. But as I look back, it has created in me gratitude and appreciation for being able to work in what I love to do. Gratitude for even being given that push to yeah. level up and to really dig into what I really want to do. And so there's so many people who are going through layoffs and I empathize so much with, with all of them because I've been there so many times, but you're so right that it, it, it ends up being a push that pushes you to a next place and it pushes you to the right place. So congratulations on, on thriving in your comeback season. Well, thank you. And you too. I mean, I know, you know, the highs, the lows and everything, and it just, shows that truly we are resilient, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I always tell my kids. And my mom told me, like, it's going to be okay because it has no choice. What else are we going to do? You know, yeah. um, 
it's going to be at the end of the day what you make it. And, and I'm thankful, you know, I love all of the brands that I've ever worked for. They're phenomenal, um, super high quality, great cultures. It is just something that happens and it's a progression of life, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So much of social media shows the wins though. And I think it's, it's so important to have a good network of people to really, really talk through when you're in the low, when you're in the comeback season, because you, you do uncover the fact that everybody has those moments. Everybody goes through what you went through last year, what I went through last year. It, everybody has the, the, those soul searching times of like, how did this just get stripped from my career, you know, and like, yeah, but, but you almost learn that it's part of the game. It's part of how careers yeah. go. It's hard. It's part of how businesses are run and it's not, it's not personal. It's not, it's not emotional. Funny. It's, it's none of that. It's really just how the game is played. So, and that's a big thing. You got to learn how to play the game and, you know, coming from being in um, the public sector, you know, working for the government, it's very safe. It's very mm -hmm. safe. Um, so when I say like, you know, jumping, you know, to the private sector, it was a risk because you risk layoffs, you risk, there's no reason, oh, your position is being phased out, whatever the case may be, whereas working for the government, you don't have those issues. And I know, I mean, even my parents were like, mm, are you sure, you know, you're the, the sole provider for your children. You want to always make sure you have that steady income, but I am a risk taker and I want to grow. I want to continue growing and I can't stay in the same place and do that. You know, that's such a healthy mindset to have. Did it's you always scary. have that mindset? <laughs> I do. And, you know, I mean, even Right now, um, you know, going through, we are about to move and my first home that I purchased, I purchased with the intent to be my investment rental property. And now I have an opportunity just came up like last month and I'm like, all right, let's do this. So never been a landlord, never done this before, but we're doing it like at the end of this month. So I am like. What could go wrong? Everything. All right, we'll get through it. <laughs> it is just that ability to step forward in the face of fear. Yes. And I think there is this perception that every move that people are out there making is a move that they're comfortable with. And this is all just flowing and it's easy. No, every day is hard. Every day is fearful. I don't yeah. know what I'm doing most of the time. And you just do it. You just figure it out. I see you on LinkedIn and, and I'm like, oh, she is living the life. No fear <laughs> there, you know, but we, we know. The yeah. Behind the scenes. And, and I yeah. think if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. Yeah. You know, so, but we can make it look good, but behind the scenes. Duck like paddling like crazy <laughs> underwater. <laughs> Exactly. But our head is still afloat. So that's it's, all that matters. <laughs> it's all calm above water for sure. So <laughs> if you and I have a conversation, even two years from now, I have you back on the society pod. What are the things that we're talking about? What are the things that, you know, you're kind of like working toward in this moment? So really, you know, just making, embracing, you know, the studio plotties and really making a name for ourselves here in the US. I just I see this amazing opportunity. Um and I want I have the the chance to embrace it and run with it. So I, I just want to be as successful with this because I am passionate about it. I want it to be, you know, as large as the other Pilates franchises because I know it is it has that ability, it has that quality. And and it's a great opportunity for me really to step into more of a leadership role, which is something that I really haven't had the opportunity to do quite yet, maybe in certain ways. But, um, you know, I just I look forward to looking back and being like, wow, we started with, you know, five and now we have seven and now we have. 
25 and now we have 50, 100. And um, really, I'm excited about potential partnerships with this brand. You know, I'm like, can we be like the official Pilates brand of the NFL or something? Like, hit me up, you know? Okay, so, so this was what I was going to ask you because because you are employee number one. And I would assume on a two-year flash forward, we have we have more staff, we have more locations, we have more partnerships, all the things. So what, what is on the wish list? What help do you need? And this is the moment to manifest it. So what else besides the NFL partnership, what else is on your wish list? Goals, but I have them, you know, um, really just establishing a U.S. headquarters here. I, just getting an amazing team boots on the ground. We have a phenomenal team in Australia and they, I mean, they fly here to open our studios, which, you know, is great. And I think the, the mix of cultures, you know, just Australia and us here in the U S it's, it's great. You know, people are fascinated um, by just when, when our staff comes here, they're, accent is so gorgeous and then when we go there they're like oh my gosh your accent and I'm like I don't got an accent you know but I think the mix of both of them it's just amazing incredible and I I definitely foresee us having a headquarters here and um you know me having an office of my own um you know but being able to still sit at tennis practice and send emails so yeah uh, that's the the future is really exciting. I love that. So we will link all of the important Studio Pilates links in the show notes, as well as all of January's information. But if you're still listening in, head over to YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast platform on YouTube, two people who like and comment on this podcast, we're going to randomly select two people to win Studio Pilates merch plus Sizzle Society merch. So you're gonna get a little like merch goodie bag if you've liked this podcast, like it, comment on it, and we're gonna choose two winners. So thank you, January, and thank you to Studio Pilates for giving the merch away. Is there anything you wanna talk about that we haven't covered? You know, not really. I think we have dove in. I just wanna say thank you so much. You know, um, what an honor to be sitting here chatting with you. And it's just been so inspiring, you know, your journey, seeing you get this platform started and just seeing your growth um, and success. It's, it's amazing. So I am just very thankful and blessed to have you in my, in my group of people that, you know, I really, I really connect with. Well, likewise. And if you're, if you're not on YouTube, you missed my epic eye roll because, uh, you know, we, <laughs> We are just over here trying to do the things. We're no big deal, but I appreciate you so much. And I look forward to connecting with you at future Women's Franchise Network events. And of course, I will be following along the Studio Pilates journey from afar. So thank you so much, January, for being on this episode of the Society Pod. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me.